you know, while they're all setting up. The one thing, I hope there's somebody from planning commission in this room. Because <laughs> very much required for them to see what, if you're not changing double digit growth, how many things can happen? And so currently they are chasing double digit growth and the infrastructure development and all the plethora of works that we saw in the second session even and the first one is done without the focus of what our country has as its focus. And uh, it's very strange, but I, I, I read an article whose title was <coughs> Speed does not matter if you're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> and I thought it was a very wonderful title. And everybody who is presented today has been going in the right direction. And if they get the speed, then you can imagine what would happen. Because it's the right direction. And even an appropriate speed would, would uh, make a huge difference. We're talking numbers of... I don't know how many houses that Sandeep Pai has uh, been involved with, how many houses built or unbuilt uh, Prasanna has been involved with, how many houses, uh, uh, residents and spaces FIDA has been involved with. We have, I believe, 20 minutes. I, it's all right, I'm going to ask questions only, don't worry. And I have some few, um, Comments and questions, but I'd, I'd much rather put them to as in the order uh, of, as they came, because I wrote down some comments like that. The two, two, three things that really came out from FIDA's presentation that uh, concerned me, or rather that uh, were very uh, good f for me to know. You know, we, she said, they engage you, and what she didn't see is then she engages them. And that's a wonderful way of, of working, that the process here has been that people engage architects who are not the actual end users, who are, the, uh, who are somebody else, an outside agency, and then some of us do engage people and the others not. Now you've always waited for being engaged so that you can engage them. That's one. Second thing that you said is that you went from public areas to private areas. And if you're trying to make a difference, at least that I know in this country, you begin with private areas to get to the public areas. And it's a very significant lesson. Would you like really to elaborate these two points because they're very significant? I'll use this one and that's it. Okay, maybe I start with the easier one, which is public to private. Um, actually, the situation in Palestine to deal with the private is so difficult. And actually, your two questions lead to each other. All the buildings that we deal with are privately owned, but it's not the case as where you go and you can tell who the owner is. The problem is during uh, the British mandate, uh, they, were, they found our old buildings and our old building style too difficult to zone. So these places were called exempt from settlement. So even from, the, no, from 1948 up until today, no zoning has been done to these areas. No inheritance has been divided. So all the buildings, like one building, would be owned by 100 people. And uh, because of the political situation in Palestine, those 100 people, probably 70% of them are out of the country. And you cannot deal with the building until the, you get the consensus from everyone that owns something in that building. And to get that consensus, you need the engagement. So our public interference in the public space, you get the... Uh, um, the blessing, I would say, from the local government or the local actors, it's easier for them to give you the okay to start working on the streets, the external facades, any open spaces. And that's when you start engaging the people living around and people who may have an ownership there. 
And that's when people trust you, because I don't think even, uh, the only way to get to people's hearts, to get them to work with you, is to see the work firsthand. They will not trust us until the work starts. So I think public, in our case, is the way to go inside the private. And uh, that's it. Uh, taking the same thing further to Sandeep by you, you're engaging a lot of people. There are three things that, that uh, came across in your presentation. That there's no two different materials, which are traditional. Bamboo is one, but so that we can determine how many minimal bricks that you need. For that, what kind of soil you need? Can it be in your backyard? Can what kind of wood you need? You know what I'm talking about. Can you can you share your thoughts? Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, is, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So I, I really haven't thought about the larger picture in terms of how uh, uh, the world would plan if uh, this had to be uh, made into a concept. But uh, every culture, every situation has been so unique and so beautiful in its own way that uh, solutions which are made for the location, for the people at that time, with the people, is what uh, has replicability, is what we have found. Uh, in uh, Bihar, as I was telling you over there, they say that there's a story again that when the Ganges comes down, she is angry and uh, she overflows and she takes everything that tries to hold itself against her. And it's the only the bamboo which bows down and touches her feet and so she lets her go. So that is why bamboo has become and that's why they say that from birth to death, there is, uh, we, we use bamboo in everything. Uh, whether it's our food, whether it's our birth ceremonies, death ceremonies, and our housing. So it's, some, it's a material that comes very easily to them. It comes uh, uh, something that they can uh, uh, do so many things with. It's re related to their, uh, uh, to their uh, not just their social and uh, physical sides, but also their spiritual sides. So uh, in every area we have found that at least these four materials of wood, stone, uh, uh, bamboo, and mud uh, build have built most of the world and uh, they have integrated these materials with uh, not just their built forms but into their lives and that is why uh, when you are able to uh, link up with that uh, the sky is the limit when it comes to creativity with that. So then let me ask you the next uh, thing because the other thing that came out from your presentation was the power of choices that when you offer choices, mm. as in Prasanna's uh, case also, the tendency for those people to make is to make the right decision. Yes. And it, what it, it brings out is that people who are in the position of making decision are used to making wrong decisions. <laughs> so how does one institutionalize the, the methodology of the power of choices. You know, I think the, the work uh, the, of the 90s and even some uh, in the 80s, or like the Lok Jumbesh program, they brought out the power of participation. And then later, the power of ownership. And I think a lot of presentations, including China and others, that when you involve people in decision making on their own lives, not just participation in terms of labor, uh, uh, if they are, if the scheme or the program is designed that you, you have to decide, here's the money, go and do what is right. And then do you provide enabling mechanisms. That is very important. The enabling mechanisms for you to take good choices so that individuals are not making choices, but your community is making choices. Uh, there's a transparency in the entire process. The, uh, 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 the availability of whatever they want in terms of material or uh, uh, technology is made to them. Uh, and I think our policies have that today. You know, I, I, in India, we always say that we have fantastic policies, implementation is useless. The uh, Ray program for urban cities or the social housing in Indira Avas Yojana are completely the way we all implement. And yet you don't see the light of day when it comes to uh, their implementation on the ground because the people who are implementing are uh, uh, not oriented in that direction. Or reluctant to offer the power. Or reluctant to, and there's so much of, uh, 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 
corruption that we want to make use of, that uh, the, the objective of these participation is lost. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of scope uh, when you allow people to, uh, uh, the, they have to make that mental shift that uh, are you going to build for me or am I going to build for myself? The moment they realize that, yes, I am going to be the decision maker, uh, then the whole atmosphere changes. But that, that, how does one, in your understanding, because you've dealt with governments, I mean, you've, you've survived dealing with governments. Uh, frankly, I did not. But uh, you've survived dealing with governments. How does one get these middle people to relinquish that power of choices. You know, the, the people at the very high decision makers, making levels would want to do that, as you've demonstrated. You know, that they would prefer that uh, for masses if something is being done and you're engaging people. But there is this middle lot. I would not call them middle men, but they act like one. Anyway, uh, how how does one get them to relinquish that power? I think uh, uh, it's all a question of leadership. And uh, even within the government, there are many people who uh, are interested in doing good. And they're looking for partnerships outside uh, in civil society. And when those people come together, I always feel that uh, uh, when two cultures come together, uh, that's where innovation happens because there's a new thought that is possible. And so that is why when you are able to identify a good master artisan in a village, so when we go around, we see how did people, somebody use bamboo differently? You know, everybody is a, not, uh, everybody is a potter, but there is one person who will make the pot differently out of 50 of them. So we, you have to be, uh, if we are able to identify that person, and then our professionals are willing to say that, no, we are willing to learn from them as well. So when a rural expert and a professional come together in any field, we found this in animal husbandry, we found it in agriculture, we found that in housing. And when these two people come together, you get solutions, you get very interesting things. And the same goes for government as a culture and uh, civil society as a culture. So if you get two people who are willing to look at each other uh, with humility, uh, then there is compassion and there is something that can happen. Thank you. Prasanna, now I get to you and your multitudes of housing. You. You showed so many projects which were dream projects that didn't realize, uh, get realized. Some of them are in the process of getting realized, or at least some of them have realized. What would have been the impact if all of them would have been realized in terms of numbers? How many people do you think would have been positively affected? Uh, the first one which we showed, I don't know in terms of numbers how what would have happened, but yes, at least yes. uh, maybe around a lakh plus or five lakh, because it was a policy actually, which the current uh, state of Maharashtra is putting in, which is under the SRA, where you have these 10 story, 20 story, 30 story, up to that layer that one is building this slum rehab, which is with lift and which is with uh, vertical and some of them are completely unoccupied to a certain extent. So that is the impact that is having because something has going on getting built, but conceptually had it been looked at differently, then it would have made a complete change. No, but if I can add to that, uh -huh. you know the, the uh, Rajiv Avas Yojana, which is for the slums now, has allocated 39,000 crores. crores. 39,000 crores of rupees, I don't even know how to convert that into uh, dollars or something else, but that's the amount of money that is available for participation in our urban cities. And the guidelines say that you have to do this only through participation. The problem is there aren't enough people who are willing to take this up and do it. But are there not enough people or are there not the mechanisms for those people to exercise their choices? Because these double figure and then multiple zeros are thereafter. We've been hearing in different areas and it never reaches. Uh, that level, what I think. Kabirji is Kabir Ji was talking about what eight thousand crores for uh, to begin with for the right, right to education. No, much higher. It was sixty thousand crores. Sorry, I can't think that high. 
but, but we not, we are talking about we are really talking about a no, big resource is not a problem. The I'm same thing is going to happen with Ray. For the last six years, there aren't enough takers, and as a result, the scheme is slowly becoming uh, going onto the back seat, and the developer-based models are uh, beginning to be uh, advocated by state governments. So, so what so does what does what do all of us, or some of us, or any of us in this room have to do I think to schools, increase the number of takers? Our schools have to go along with the times. They have to realize that all the models that were developed in, uh, on uh, participation in the 80s and 90s, today India has the money to be able to allocate money to that. Our schools are not keeping up with training professionals. There are a lot of interest in students in all these alternative models. But unfortunately, the schools are not giving them that opportunities or training them to be able to do this. So you think that the faculty is need to be trained first? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm seriously asking you. You know, I think uh, I'm very serious because I think uh, we come across a lot of people who say, but we, we think like this, but the faculty tells us to do something else. No, it will be a lost opportunity. If this what do you think, Prasanna? Because it is, I think it is simpler to train the students than the faculty, I think. And uh, that is always because they have the open mind. And why not professional itself? Because we have seen a lot of professionals also now participating in it. Because that is the layer where it will change. Because it will take time for the students to really get nurtured into it. But what we have seen with Ray and BSUP also is that as he has rightly said, midway through somewhere this completely fails. And these kind of demonstrations which take a lot of time. The whole issue is of time, you know, it has taken us four years to build 571 houses to negotiate only. The whole issue is of negotiation to make the people come together and agree to it. But that would be true for the first case because as Sanjay was saying, you know, first year record zero, second year, I don't remember, but the third year and then onwards, it's a lot more. What is in Palestinian context? Is there such a problem that we are discussing here oh, in the yeah. context? <laughs> We're building actually a new city in Palestine. No, the, the context is highly driven with pro by profit, neoliberal economies. We're a very profit-seeking, I'm sorry to say, culture now. And it's driven by the government, by donors who want to see Palestine being, I don't know, the model of economic stability at one point. So it's not just education. I think I think it's it takes um, an aggressive form of resistance. I don't know how to say it, but there's a big uh, there's a strong shift towards market economies in my country. That you need to take a stand. Whatever we've been doing at Ruwak, we're giving an alternative, but we're just a nonprofit. We're just 15 people working there, and whatever change we're making, it's not enough compared to the pressure that's being put on cities to the extent that we're building, actually, for the first time in 10,000 years, a new city is being built in Palestine. And do they let you perform any role in that with your background? In building new things? No. Oh. No. <laughs> No, don't. You, you they, they, copy, the <laughs> they copy. They copy. They um, copy mm. the plans of Israeli settlements, actually, and just tweak them to the geography, and that's it. Um, no, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of effort to give an alternative to what's happening, and I think there should be a push towards official buy-in in what we're doing. Education will help, but then at the end of the day, people in our profession will not make as much money as people following the mainstream, and that's the challenge. How would you convince newly graduated people that, you know, come and work with us, you'll get paid good money, but compared to whatever is happening, you're not being paid enough. And with the market being blooming, your, I would say, new needs require the new money you're making. Yeah, and your new aspirations, unfortunately, but this is, I think, the case in many countries. So I think there should be a, a very, I don't know, I have no solution to this. We're still trying an aggressive approach to get officials on board. Uh, last uh, set of re responses, Prasanna. A lot of disappointment that you've gone through in all this and yet come through. So what is the positivity that you're carrying with you to push more aggressively? 
I think when you finally deal with people and whatever you build, to see their happy faces, then they are always uh, in there, you know, with us. So when we were walking through these slums, my team was all the time there and hardly used to go there. So they were leading through and they were asking, who is this person? We have never seen him around, you know, at times when it is being building. But that is where at least you have contributed all the time there. And what I also feel is when you are saying is, I feel that, I, I believe that politicians are the main people. If we can convince at that layer, because you are talking about the middle layer and the top layer. It is the bottom, if the people's pressure, which can push the politicians to take the right decision. And this, I think, is possible. And we have seen it like the streets that we are doing where we have shown a very small model, but that is pushing through the corporators at the local level and trying to say that if you do people's good, it will directly result in votes. And that is what will actually get the society to put pressure on changing the policies the right way. Sandeep, what positivities you are carrying through? No, no, I think uh, for, for all of us, we have been able to do something. So we are always positive. No, beyond that, beyond but, that. No, uh, if it were not positive, I think it would not have been able to re get realized. But in all this, it's... Uh, no, what it's, a, it's a very selfish process. We want satisfaction. And uh, we have been able to get that satisfaction. So after that, I don't care if anybody else is being able to do it or not. <laughs> so actually, you know, there's a lovely uh, quote that I read a couple of days ago. It said that, uh, yesterday I was I was clever and I was trying to change the world. Today I am wise and I'm trying to change myself. So as long as I'm uh, with myself, I don't care a damn. <laughs> True. You, Vida? Well, I I, mm, I think I, in addition to uh, ha having to see people happy at the end of your project, I think the the main source of being positive is that people really don't need me anymore. Like when I work, uh, when I when I work in the villages and places where we work, we, we never have money to do the whole village. We only have money to do a neighborhood and just leave. But when I leave and I go back two years ago, and th the good part of being director at the office is that I get really to travel to every single village. So for me, it's like I know every single village in Palestine. Well, they're not as many as in India, but I know them all. And when I discovered that after we left and I go back and the community has done their own thing and they have their own process and their own mechanism and they don't need to call me anymore, I think that makes me like in the clouds. Lovely. The, I think if I sum up all of this and what attitude that each one of us do can carry to increase the number of masses that we can engage uh, with is that we have a responsibility to initiate an action which is so inherently appropriate that it can snowball by itself. I think with that, we'll sum this up. Thank you. Thank you.